Hello everybody, welcome to the Sandbagger News Show. It's a windy November morning in Grand Forks, North Dakota. This is our very first episode on the air. We are very grateful and very excited. To learn a bit with you about sandbagging. And dance with that isness that be isn all through the Red River Valley and far beyond. When I was young, there was a flood. Everybody had to run. The Red River swallowed us up. To this day, she meanders on. reminds us all of what we are. Tiny sandbaggers trying to survive. Mighty sandbaggers singing through the night. The rising water and the changing tide. Once upon a time, not too many generations away, the earth hadn't gone 26,000 more times round the sun than it has today. The oceans were frozen and the sea level fell so much to allow the first humans to walk across the continents into the new dark North America. That was the time of the woolly mammoth and the saber-toothed cat. Before people's spears laid claim to a world yet wild and untamed Eventually the climate warmed and the glaciers went away for now The seas rose and told the immigrants to sand dance they could not return By then, the ice had melted into a massive lake Far bigger than anything we got round today Or even that big old Hudson Bay And the birth of the Red River Valley Wouldn't be for another 12,000 years One day in the woods, a man was walking with his clan. His ancestors came the way they could never go back. They'd been to the East Coast, they didn't like what they'd seen. They turned round when they found out about their new destiny. Your home is on the lake On which the rice grows everywhere You're bound to make your way But watch out for the danger It'll come at you from every which way On that fateful day You were led out of the prison compound they were shackled and chained together. And who taught them? It was just a hundred fifty years ago when the water broke down the wall. The white man got his way with the weight of cannonballs. Lincoln's men took the Dakota indigenous, put them up in cages. One day took thirty-eight of them in the light of day. 
And he hanged them in the square Mankato, Minnesota in the open air The country's largest mass execution ever While the Civil War was happening elsewhere It was six months later, Governor Ramsey rode north To Ojibwe land, to that old cross inn for a treaty meeting To threaten them with the deaths of their indigenous brethren And to claim to lay the blame on them for everything they never did Saying our people will never know the difference we can tell them whatever we'd like to say So we can carry on with the violence But do you really want to make this any harder than it has to be? The Red Lake River still flows as it always has To the west, to the west, to the west The remnants of Lake Agassiz in the Red River Valley Flowing north, flowing north, flowing north And that little armpit in the river a pretty spot they called Grand Forks With all the trees they'd be chopping down in Red Lake They wanted somebody to turn them logs round the corner So they could ship that stuff to market and Make a living in this world we got something we're trying to be passing down and it don't matter who gets hurt Don't you know the Red River Valley's got the best soil in the world? In the world, in the world, in the world And that's because of everything that came before us Came before, came before, came before we assume that we can do this forever without consequence or fear and we know we don't gotta do nothing different because of who it is put us here but growing up in young g-funk's really pretty fun you can learn a lot learn a lot learn a lot However you may spin it, it does happen to be my home Only home, only home, only home And I know I'll have to leave it If I ever expect to return It's something that is desperately needed Maybe with a myth and a sunburn then in 1897 The Big Red River flooded the banks Somebody said, ah, oh, don't worry about it, man It won't happen again for another hundred years By then, who knows, I suppose they'll have everything they need You can only hope, only hope, only hope our children's children's children on their own The sandbag on, sandbag on, sandbag on Well a hundred years went on The people plant in their crops the machines changed a lot, but the people did not, 
that they say is tradition. Though 95% of the state's grassland has been mowed and plowed, they'd been there for centuries. In a couple hours, we erased them out. That they say is tradition. Ils ont changé ma chanson, ma. Ils ont changé ma chanson. C'est la seule chose que je peux faire. Et ne c'est pas bon, ma. C'est disait il la tradition. Is it tradition never changes? Didn't our ancestors live in amazement? You know the only home that we'll ever know is the one we share with everyone. Oh yeah, that in fact is tradition. Who to thunk? <laughs>
sequences will highlight each sandbagger hoop. Different areas that we're interested in and things we're excited to learn about. The sandbagger harvester hoop concerns the human environment relationship. We'll talk about science and natural history, trying to learn how we can best live in tune with the ecological conscience. How ought sandbaggers best fit into a world of rising water? What you're looking at is part of the uh, natural heritage a unique part of the natural heritage of the state of North Dakota, actually. But you're looking out there, and if you just take a minute to look at it, that is the largest fragment of unplowed prairie in the Red River Valley. It was prairie that was developed over 10,000 years after glacial Lake Agassiz receded. And it's the result of a thick layer of dark soil. And these soils, in turn, what they support is a, a tremendous diversity of plants. Uh, over 230 species of plants have been recorded from this prairie. There's also a tremendous diversity of birds, insects, uh, mammals are all on this site. This is the mission of the University of North Dakota. To teach each other, to learn together, to advance our understanding, in this case, of our natural world. So this is a tremendous collaborative opportunity for us to understand grasslands ecology. Ecology is, in a sense, the understanding of how these various components collaborate. As we understand better the interactions between the systems within our plant and animal worlds, I think it helps us as human beings understand our role in managing and uh, helping to sustain uh, these systems for the benefit of the generations to come. Our school colors. Go UND! <laughs> so Oakfield Prairie is really special for UND. Uh, the university owns it. Professors do research out here, students do research out here. They work with landowners, uh, producers in the area. It's just today becoming a wildlife management area. It means it's going to be open to the public now. Several thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago or more, this was a, a rather large gl glacial lake. We see a lot of these beach ridges here. And right now I can show you one of the things that we kind of see. Uh, and we see kind of a transition from this lower wetter area out in the nose here. And we see a transition in the species here. We got a lot of little blue stem coming in. We got this Pieta Morpha. This is, uh, this is a really nice uh, legume right here. We start picking that up, and we can even just follow this on up the uh, on up the uh, incline here, and we start picking up more of the solidago. We got uh, unfortunately we got melalotus, but we see it just a, a rapid change in the species composition uh, as we just just you know over that less than 10 meters distance. This is a part of North Dakota's heritage, and this site and this place is a part of what it means to be North Dakota. From the metal legs all the way down to the soil nematodes, and the plants that are there, and the mosquitoes that are there, everything, right? Um, it's all part of it, and I'm so happy to see so many people out here enjoying um, the resource and what's out here and really celebrating it. Birds are our most familiar aspect of experiencing nature. In the Red River Valley of North Dakota, a deep, rich topsoil formed from the prairie plants that had grown there for thousands of years. But today, it is estimated that 95 to 99 percent of the original tall grass prairie has been converted to agricultural cropland. With the loss of grassland fields, the only habitat remaining for grassland species is at best narrow strips of grass along section lines and drainage ditches. 
The western meadowlark, the state bird of North Dakota, with its requirement for five or more acres of grassland, cannot successfully nest in such a narrow strip. There can be no doubt that the loss of meadowlarks in North Dakota is due to a loss of grassland habitat. How about the one on top? That's it, right there. You know what that is? In the yellow? Yeah. No, that's a gross. You have no idea. <laughs> what the heck is that? There's probably a couple of them down in those flowers because they like those. Well, they might be. I don't know how they're going. About 20 years ago, our office cooperated with an Eagle Scout on their Eagle Scout project to build an interpretive trail around a wetland just east of Bismarck. And so we had about 50 volunteers, but we lined up an opening speaker, and that was former Governor Art Link. So he got everybody close together and he said, before I say anything, I want everybody to pause for a moment and I will begin my remarks after we hear the first metal art song. And everybody kind of looked at each other and paused for about five seconds. And sure enough, about 100 feet down the parking lot, a metal arc sounded off on top of a fence post, and Art got this big smile on his face, and it stuck with me 20 years later because he knew the value of a symbol like a metal arc, and he got people to rally around it. When I was growing up, the metal arc was certainly the uh, the first sign of spring, and when when you heard the metal arcs, you knew that uh, we were going to have spring again for the year. And my folks weren't really bird people, but they were uh, always interested in, in uh, listening for the metal art. The Czechoslovakian words that they used to mimic the, the uh, metal art song was Pepik Stracioklajiva, <laughs> which, and I'm, I'm recalling this from memory. It sounds uh, like a metal art. Yeah, and it was Johnny lost his hammer, is what it meant. <laughs> Something like that, I don't know. Every fall, I'm out in the prairie uh, hunting other activities and I always mark on my calendar the last metal lark of the season and usually it's around the, somewhere between the 15th and 20th of October and I believe it's the uh, immature males that are just learning to sing, they're practicing, they know this is going to be an important part of their life come the following spring and so every fall. I'm listening and I'll make notes on my calendar and keep pushing it back until, the, until there are no more. Our son came to visit us from Japan. He's been living in Japan for a couple of years. And he brought his girlfriend with him. So we took him out to the Badlands. We took a family trip out there. We were walking along one of those little trails out in uh, Teddy Roosevelt National Park. And we heard a, uh, a meadowlark sing. And so I turned to Raina, and I said, that's a meadowlark. She said, how do you know? I said, by the song. The song is very distinctive. Um, she grew up in Osaka, and they don't get many birds in Osaka. I think she was impressed that I knew what the bird was by the song, and I felt like I was a real naturalist. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> so it was, a good, it was one of those little introductory moments to North Dakota from somebody from really far away and somebody who is, she's now going to be a daughter-in-law, so she's got to know, she's got to know about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the relationship between soil and water goes back billions of years, when rainwater, freezing and thawing in the cracks of rocks, broke off tiny mineral fragments that built up over millennia to become the only known soil in the universe, out of which the common ancestor to all life on Earth once crawled. For ecologists Diana Wall and Osvaldo Sala, water matters to soil in another way. It provides a home to the countless unseen life forms that live in the soil and make it such a wonderful place for life to form. To study how changes in rainfall that are predicted to occur with climate change might affect both life above and below the soil horizon, the team builds rainout shelters at three research stations across the western United States. One that's wet in Kansas, one that's dry in New Mexico, and one somewhere in between in Colorado. Outside Colorado State University, the team measures out their experimental plots. 
Those with shelters receive less rainfall and direct water to those hooked up with sprinklers, which will simulate heavy rainfall. They'll compare to plots that get ambient rainfall, and with video cameras and other sensors, they'll see what changes underground. So Cecilia, we have some of this. After weeks in the shop, yeah. the system is up and running. It, it was a Sunday afternoon, we calibrated all the irrigation, but we didn't have time to double check if everything was all right. So that's why we really need to come here as soon as possible and, and check if the things are working well. So we have this float suite and when, the, when it's raining, the water comes from the gutters and then the float suite turn the pump on and then we, we send water to the irrigation. The team predicts that an altered rainfall regimen will impact nematodes, microscopic worms found in soils all over the world. The team's work in the dry valleys of Antarctica, for example, has shown that water is everything to the microscopic life that's arisen in the coldest, driest soil on Earth. But it's not easy to identify nematodes in the lab. They first must be sampled, collected, moved to a microscope, and separated by feeding group. Today we've got a woman called uh, Dorota who's going to come in and um, teach us about how to identify the different genera a little broader than species, um, but still quite complex and they can be very similar to one another and the differences between them are, are a little subtle. Nematodes are the most abundant um, animals on Earth. For every five animals, four of them are nematodes. Okay, so really just amazing um, way how they occupy all sorts of environments. Did you get one yet? Yeah. I cannot even <laughs> see the thing. <laughs> After one last trip to the field to fix a few last minute changes to the irrigation system, the experiment will be underway soon. Precipitation is the, is the, the principle, the major control in the primary productivity. So here we simulated some scenarios that we are we're expecting to have in the next few years with climate change and the global change. It's good. And we are very excited for the next year for the first sampling and begin to have data and to look the the responses of the of our our friends, our below ground community. <laughs>
that should be within here for the offspring. The mom should be in this, which is the eggshell. So we're collecting both of those. Ready to go. Susan, copy, Sam. Uh, I was just gonna ask Susan, do you guys want us to keep moving uh, to the east a little bit? Or should we so I'd say let's all just kind of bounce together here, yeah. down around these islands. And then as we get stuff, you stop at one, we'll keep going, right. and just kind of follow each other that way. Make sure as we get down here, the willows will get taller. One person's constantly got their head up. Yep. Okay? Just looking. Okay. Be loud, keep yeah. your head on the swivel, stay close. Hey there! Come oh, here! How's it going? See, the reason you gotta be careful in the willows is because you don't wanna stumble across a bear who doesn't see you. Most bears are gonna run when they see us coming, but if we turn the corner to the willows and startle one that's sleeping, you never know what might happen. Grab the membranes while you're there, but just do it quickly. Just grab them and get away from there to light up your stuff. This will be 43. Excuse me, bud. I know there's four of you, so there should be four shells. Can you pluck them up a little bit? Yeah, so I got four. I'll pluck them in. So they don't run away. Okay, let's go. We sampled as quick as we could so that the, the two can get back on their nest and keep them warm. I think that's them right there. The sandbagger voyageur hoop will take us to distant lands, following in the footsteps of humans who have come before, on the pursuit of the good life, good times, and a future for their children. So can I actually call those Canadian now, Susan? Can I call those Canadian geese now? Canadian Canada geese. We drove up to Winnipeg this fall to attend the National Wildlife Society conference. So the Unity Wildlife Society came here to the zoo in Winnipeg. Uh, we're just killing some time before we head up to the conference. Um, we were just checking out the polar bear exhibit. As you can see, this is going on right now. And all the biology students come running. More than anything, we were excited to meet other young people who are passionate about communicating the conservation of wildlife. Andrew is from Mississippi State. He's just super aware of his impact on everything, wants to make a difference, super chill. So we'd been to the zoo and got polar bears on camera, but I was supposed to go on a guided tour of the facilities afterwards. But I ended up skipping it, and I skipped a bunch of talks the next day just so I could hang out with these guys. That's so when we ended the key Ted, and he invited you, Jeremy, Nick, and uh, yeah, just you four. Honestly, you know, I met a lot of wildlife people. You know, we honestly never sat down and asked the other person why they chose wildlife. It was just one of these things of like an assumption that you love wildlife, <laughs> an assumption that you want to make a difference in wildlife. There was never this, you know, like question that was asked and answered. It was just assumed. And I think the one thing that like just kind of brought it all out was like, before you even knew it, but we all asked the general question of like why we decided to be a wildlife major. And I think that was a, a, a turning point in, you know, the, the whole conversation. In Iceland, we track down my grandma's ancestry to the 8th century and breathe in the same air as our ancestors did more than a millennium before. Through Reykjavik along the Ring Road to the first stop on their cultural expedition. I wonder what this looks like. It looked like this on Palace, yeah. the former home so, of her grandfather, Jon Gislason. Great, great grandpa's farm, Billy. My great great grandpa. Your great great. My grandpa. My great. Her grandpa. Her grandpa's farm. My great. Your great great. You can take a picture. I was gonna say if you guys want to stand over there, I'll take a picture. Icelandic roots database and they have census records and then 
when you go into each individual person's record, there is a map that you can click on and it will show you all of the locations from any census records or marriage licenses or death certificates and it will give you like a map of their life and it will give you pinpoints all over Iceland and then in North Dakota or wherever they went to from there they ended up from and you can use that to create a map to come find them. And drove right to it. And then just a little bit of direction. Google work to figure yeah. out the GPS coordinates, well, and we're here. Yeah. 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 GPS yeah. coordinates, I don't understand tell, plug them into Google, yeah. then you're here. Yeah. Can you imagine There's sitting some. down with great grandpa and telling him this like 100 yeah. years later, we're going to yeah. find you by using GPS satellites? <laughs> yeah. It would be like, why? Satellites in the sky. How many days? I don't imagine this has changed much. No. 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 This probably hasn't changed. Yeah, it's funny feeling. <laughs> funny feeling. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I bet they did color the color bail. Yeah, those like rock formations right there. I think they are. Oh, no, I it looks like a couple windows are open. Okay, What's Yolan's last name? Contact us. Who's? Yolan. Oh, Yolan. Huh? Gislason. G I S S. No. G I S L A S O N. G I S. Gislason. Well, like in Norway, my family, we're called Brenna because we moved to the Brenna farm, which means burn clearing. So the farm was made because they burned the clearing. And like, but they moved to that farm. And so instead of like na renaming it after themselves, they took the name of the farm instead. Did yes. they change their own name? Yep. Yeah. My mom did. Yeah. Middle. Yeah. Middle is the township they came from. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, so your the mom was Margaret Middle. Changed to Middle. Yeah. When they came to the U.S., too many people with the same last name when they came there, because they're everybody is a a son, a dad's or a first daughter. name and a son. Yeah. So there's just way too many. So they changed their names. They mostly took the names of their township where they came from. Big one. No, I won't. I won't. I will get it. What else should we take? Big fella. What else should I take? Why That's is the one you're taking? So, why yeah. is the suitcase so heavy, man? Yeah. Yeah, jeez. Yeah, oh, shoot. What if I think it's lava? No, they won't, will they? No. They won't even check it if you put it in your check bag. I'm nah. going to. <laughs> I'm going to scrub it all up and put a date on it. So, uh, we're leaving a note here to put in the mailbox of the farmers. Uh, it says, hello, we are visitors from North Dakota, USA. My Emma Darlene's grandfather, Jon Gislason, was born here at Hall. We stopped by to take a few pictures. It is beautiful. You can contact us via Facebook if you would like to. And I left all of our full names. And talk Fira, Darlene, Diana, Angela, and Will. Nice! Your family. <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know who lives here. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> an orange one. Thank you, Bell Rocks. Yeah. <laughs> In case you're watching. Awesome. Well, hopefully, they find it. Booyah! In Obashing, on the Red Lake Reservation, we keep our language alive through passing the teachings to our next generation. Obashing is home to the highest concentration of Ojibwe Moan speakers in the world. At the Red Lake Language and Culture Camp, we pass on our language and the seven teachings to the next generation. Be mosaken no indigenous makuan do dem. Oga kaning and donjaba. We hold the Gabeshiwin every summer, a summer camp to help teach our kids more about our language, our culture, our traditions. Been, we've been here, what, three years? Going on, uh, it was three years, three summers. I've yet to go swimming. I've yet to go berry picking. <laughs> I've yet to do anything but stay here and watch the kids. I'll slow down when they lay me down. That's when I'll slow down. <laughs> Oh my god! Happy. It's when I'm smiling and when I'm having fun. It looks like you're sweaty. <laughs> I am. I've been in the sun playing lacrosse. 
You very hot? Yep. This is my happy dance. <laughs> it's really amazing to see these kids starting to grasp more of our identity, our way of life, the seven teachings. Bravery, Zoom gave the win. A lot of those kids aren't used to speaking in public, and that's hard for a lot of them. And a lot of them showed bravery, even though they didn't want to do it. Who knows the seven clans? Oh. Uh, yeah, you're in first. Do I stay on the Ojibwe? Both. Ojibwe and English. Oh. Yeah, I can't do it. Just say them. Can't just say Honesty, Guayaqua Dizzy win. First and foremost, being honest with who they are, their own identity. Makua and Duden. Obashing and Dunjaba. Tamaran and Dijinakaz. Washington, We're gonna race, see who's faster. I'm Lily, I'm nine. <laughs> I think Lily's gonna win. We saw those kids playing with one another, being very honest with how they were interacting with one another. Hey, cheater! She went before me! Let's go back to Joel. Race again, because she cheated. She did? She went in front of me. Okay, okay. You know, we have a seven grandfather teachings and the number one teaching that we're taught is to love one another. Love. Zagi Hidoen. That's where a lot of people get confused, you know. They think they have to love someone because they're relatives of them. Without them acknowledging that we are all related. It's that circle. Not only loving everyone at the camp, but loving all animals, all plants and understanding our role, the interrelatedness of everything. Love eagles in action. Those are pelicans, yo. Hey. Yep. They look so... Pelicans are cool too, though. Wait, video me saying something. Okay. I call them choke cherries. Oh, okay, I've heard of that. Before. I call them snake you know, nuggets. say thank you? Me Gwitch. Me Gwitch. Oh yeah, me Gwitch. Me Gwitch. Me Gwitch. Thank you. The, the, the plant is tasty. My goal for this documentary was to uh, create a conversation and raise awareness on these issues and to shed light on something that our community needs to be talking about a lot more. As the U.S. Attorney, I'm the top federal law enforcement official in, in the state. And what I've been seeing and hearing is absolutely terrifying. We're dealing with drugs right now where you don't get mistakes. And like you said, you don't get do-overs. So it's very crucial that we teach kids decision-making skills before they get to that point. These drugs, they are dangerous, they are addictive, and the furanyl fentanyl, which you're referring to, is just one derivative of a drug that is used in my emergency department for people, uh, for anesthesia, for severe pain, for cancer-associated pain. This is a very strong community for alcohol use. Somebody brought up how marijuana was a gateway drug, you know, um, and they were like, I think we saw I think we saw examples of that like three times in the film, but I feel like the biggest gateway drug is alcohol, and I feel like we saw that every time in the film, what people were talking about, what they first started with, was drinking. You know, even when we're talking about alcohol, what, what really scares me is when I hear parents, especially after something like fentanyl comes out, say, well, boy, I'm sure glad my kids just drink. I mean, I don't know about the parties you went to in high school, but the parties I went to, I mean, loads of parents were just like, yeah, here's alcohol for you. <laughs> and it was just okay, you know? So it never felt like you were abusing a substance. And your parents condoned it, so obviously it was an okay thing. And we're having kids out there that are making life decisions um, under the influence. And, and I think that definitely leads to poor decisions. You know, having a few drinks with friends and then your inhibitions are down and so, when somebody offers you something else, it'd be a lot easier to take, you know? And so then you're not, you're not um, prepared for it. You're not sure what you're actually taking or about to do. When you, when you listen to Bradbury talk about our, 
our, our, our hockey team, right? And he talks about why did they win? And he says, what do we have in Grand Forks, North Dakota in our hockey program? We have a culture, a culture of winning. Absolutely glorifies alcohol. Like that's, that's your analogy? Because that's really what it is. I mean, you go to those hockey games and it's just a bunch of people binge drinking. I mean, your parents, your parents' friends, whoever, like completely drunk out of their mind and <laughs> um, and that's what you grow up with, so that's what you know. And what we need in our communities is a culture, a culture change where we don't have a permissive culture for drug use. And that's what we need. I mean, it's, there's a lot of weird things that we have uh, embedded into this culture. <laughs> I think he was trying to make a good point of like, look at this, like this way that we bring a community together through sports or whatever. In actuality, it's just a way that we bring people together, yeah, to use the substance. I would like to hear your guys' thoughts on marijuana. Hey everybody, how you doing? That felt like a lot of information all at once. Uh, whatever it is, we here at Sandbagger News would just like to show it to you and, and offer it up as something we might call sandbagging. Something in which it requires everybody coming together, contributing their skills equally to achieve something that neither none of them could do on their own. Uh, whether that applies to talking about science problems, society problems. We recognize a tradition of change for this first episode of the Sandbagger News Show. We wanted to highlight the different areas we'll be covering over the coming weeks. So um, we're going to be an hour-long show, if you're listening here on the radio, KEQQ 88.3 FM in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Or if you're watching on Facebook or uh, YouTube or elsewhere, thank you for joining us. This was episode one. If you're listening and not watching, uh, you can go online and there's video to go along with all the audio you've heard so far today. And very much so, we would like your feedback. If you viewers have uh, ideas or suggestions or... Uh, ways we might collaborate on some kind of cool project, uh, whatever it is, or you just want to chat and say hello. We are always standing by to hang out and make new friends and uh, find new ways to sandbag. So any comments at all, send them our way. We'll be happy to chat with you. Come on the show and we can talk for everybody too. What it is really we're talking about is something we call a tradition of change. You know, when you think of tradition we seem to think of something that does not change. But the truth is, if my ancestors never changed their thought process, altered the way they did things throughout time, we wouldn't be here today. You know, I was only three years old when the flood happened in 1997 here in the Red River Valley. And, you know, so I don't really remember, remember it. But I've grown up my whole life hearing these stories of sandbaggers these superhero people who come out of nowhere, who like rise up out of the ground, or like come out of the mist, and there they are to help, to, to work together at all costs, to address what's in front of us now. And I was always amazed, so amazed by that, you know, growing up, then we would go sandbagging ourselves, building a wall around somebody's home or around along the riverbank to stop the water prevent you know people from losing their homes and their livelihoods it's like man this is fun see the cool thing about it is they let all the kids out of school and they just show up you know they're, they're not honestly ordered to go sandbagging they just that's what you do you know that's what happens when you zoom out and take sort of an ecological perspective on the whole matter you'll you'll realize you're looking at this this very sophisticated organism seemingly made up of all of these individual parts, these people, and, and all of these streams and the weight of gravity in the water doing its thing. Uh, you'll see that this just happens. Like the same way you breathe, you know, or, or sleep. Uh, it just, it's it's got to happen. So a sandbagger doesn't do much 
of anything at all, actually. Um, you actually let go and you find yourself sandbagging because if, if you're a sandbagger, then you sandbag and nothing's going to nothing's gonna stop that but your own problems if you find yourself stopping. So the, the tradition of change has taken us many places. It's going to take us new places yet. It's going to make us new friends. And uh, we're excited, you know. We can just uh, go go along with it and embrace it. And the uh, more you do that together with people, you take life one minute at a time, one sandbag at a time, it feels like you're doing something right, naturally. So thank you for joining us. Uh, just a couple minutes left now. We'll leave you with a, a song. It's part of the tradition of change thing. You might recognize the melody of some music we play sometime, um, but you may notice the words are completely changed. And this is one way we try to prove the point of that tradition of change. Take something you expect it to be one way and kind of twist it on itself somehow and create for it uh, another meaning, uh, an extended meaning. Um, one that is itself something that's supposed to change. Either way, uh, we'll leave you with it and say thank you so much for being here. Everybody, uh, take care and sandbag on. You gotta go soon, take nothing with you, it won't last. Whatever you think you see moving is really motion. Stand your sandbags by the banks Fighting back the nothing in its way Look down, kid, your water's gone away But the floods will come again Yeah.